Uh, Cocoa TV 2.0. Uh, it's going to be an upcoming release, uh, API breaking one at that. Uh, Cocoa TV. Okay, maybe not. All right, so uh, who am I to talk about this? Uh, I am uh, Caleb Barrett. I've been a daily user since uh, 2018. I've been a maintainer since 2020. Currently work at uh, Hudson River Trading doing FPGA verification where I use Cocoa TV every single day. And uh, we use a bunch of different ROS tools, uh, Verilator, you know, Python, C++, Trio, you can kind of name it. Um, and uh, I'm kind of proud of my uh, significant but overall negative uh, contributions to Cocoa TV. I think that's a pretty good sign. So why do we need to use Co uh, do Cocoa TV 2.0? Well, there were some uh, API breaking changes that we needed to make. Um, the public API needed to be refined a little bit. And uh, there were some foot guns that needed to get replaced. So uh, we thought about ways to do that. And, but we wanted to break as little as possible. This is not going to be a switch from like 2.0, uh, Python 2 to Python 3. I've had a couple people comment to me about that uh, just over the past couple days. Um, so I kind of imagine it as a glow up. If anybody's familiar with that term, it's kind of like. <laughs> uh, so it's a. Uh, a term used by younger people uh, just means that you know something's become more refined, more mature, and um, we have a uh, description there from uh, Werewolf Girl um, on uh, Urban Dictionary. Give you a little bit better background on that. All right, so we're going to go into each of the different uh, pieces of Cocoa TV and uh, what's been changed. So the first one's going to be on the project automation. So the Python runner is the new way to run simulations in Cocoa TV. So some of you may be familiar with the make files, and make files are really fun. Um, so we decided to replace them. And this works on Windows a little bit better. We don't have to have a POSIX environment. Uh, we, you know, it's Python, and it's a little bit better than make. And uh, it was originally based on Cocoa TV test uh, by Tamaj Embrek, um, and uh, he's moved that into uh, Cocoa TV proper. And the fun thing here is we can leverage the Python ecosystem, uh, PyTest ecosystem. So here's a little uh, comparison between the two. You know, we selecting our simulators, Icarus. Uh, we have our sources and um, setting up defines and clues and all that. But we can see with the Python runner, we have a little bit more abstraction available. You know, we're defining includes and defines instead of having to know what the actual um, option syntax is for the particular uh, simulator which makes it easier to switch between simulators. Um, also, we have a little bit better support for mixed language and a couple other small things, and we'll see that in the next slide. So here we are uh, leveraging some PyTest functionality. We're using Parameterize to uh, run many different tests here. So we can see we have four different options of depth with you know, ready and valid fractions for testing this FIFO. And that's going to explode and run, uh, what is that? 64 different tests. So you write it once, run 64 tests. And those of you familiar with PyTest may know that you can install PyTest XTest and run this all in parallel too. All right, so the next uh, section is on test discovery and generation. So test discovery was slightly changed. Uh, Cocoa TV test decorator used to return test objects and things were discovered that way. And that caused some limitations, so we decided to change that a bit. And this allows us to reuse test definitions, not just in the same module, but in other modules as well. As you kind of see that with the uh, PyUVM example I have there. So we're uh, decorating that uh, PyUVM test, and then right below it, we are inheriting from it to extend it. That was previously not possible due to the way that the uh, old decorator worked. Right. Uh, but there is going to be some potential incompatibilities because of the way things were changed. So if you have any bespoke test generation uh, code, you might need to update that. All right, the next big feature is Cocoa TV to parameterize. Uh, those of you familiar with PyTest uh, may uh, see this is kind of familiar. So it's a way of generating multiple tests from a single definition. And um, it's a replacement for test factory. So some of you may be familiar with that. Um, you list all the options for each of your uh, test inputs, and it explodes all of them. So in this case, it would run four different tests with each of the combinations. All right. 
So here is an example of that. So we can see that same uh, parameterized test there on the left. And, oh, oh, sorry. On the top left, we can see uh, the same thing set up with uh, test factory. And we can see how it's set up there on the right. And as you can see, the names have changed slightly. So it used to be just uh, test FIFO 001, 002. It's not very helpful, is it? Um, so parameterized gives you slightly better names by putting the um, option names and the values in the actual test itself. And that works really well with the next feature, the uh, CocoTV test filter. So this is a replacement for the test case a variable. And um, it's going to be a regular expression, which is going to allow you to select over multiple tests a little bit more easily. And uh, so we're going to go through a couple examples here. So we have another parameterized test here. And you can see there uh, we have three different options, an error rate, pull rate, and two in resync rate, so that's a total of 18 tests we're gonna generate, and we wanna run all of them. So that's how you could do it with a Coca TV test filter. We're just gonna use a regular expression to match all the test names. Uh, and below is like a cut off version of how you would do that with test case, where you'd have to copy and paste every single test name in a comma separated list. So, oh, here's another example, uh, running tests where only the pull rate is 50. So this is a regular expression, and we know with parameterized, we have the names in the test now, so we can write a pretty simple regular expression to select only the subset of tests that we care about. All right, modeling types. Yes, dreaded uh, binary value. It's finally been replaced. Um, it's been replaced actually with a set of types now. Uh, there's logic, which is a nine-value scalar logic type. Uh, range, which is like a write inclusive version of Python's range object, because ranges in HDL tend to be write inclusive. Um, array is list like, but it uses range to be able to do uh, support arbitrary indexing schemes, uh, kind of like most HDL array types. And a logic array is just an array of logics with some bitwise operations. And why do we replace it? Well, there were definitely bugs in it, and uh, the entire design fundamentally assumes everything is zero, one, so you can't deal with uh, X's, Z's, or the wider set of values that you might be able, uh, might need to do with the HDLs. And of course, it didn't support indexing, which was just like a cardinal sin, in my opinion. All right, so uh, array, you can kind of see how it might work up there. So uh, head registers can be typed. You can put in whatever types you want. And uh, you can see in the second example, we're using a range object to describe how you do your custom indexing scheme, where we can see that's being used in the third section. 56 is on the left, so we get one when we index into it. 53 is on the right, so we get uh, four. And you can use that same, you know, 56 down to 53 syntax if you're familiar with uh, Verilog, I mean, sorry, with VHDL. Or you can just use inferred, um, like uh, Verilog, where it's just the left and the right. Um, and, but otherwise, it works just like list. All right, logic array. It's very similar to array, but it just forces everything to be a logic. And that allows us to add in things like bitwise operations, where you can see that on a section, second section where and, or, logical not, and of course you can convert to and from integers just like you could binary value, but we have a little bit more explicit interface now and that allows you to not have to deal with some of the uh, difficult to use parts of the interface of um, binary value, which we're going to talk about right now. Binary representation was removed, Bengenian was removed. Those were fundamentally pieces of binary value, but it makes it a little bit difficult to use, in my opinion, so those were removed. Uh, arithmetic operations were removed. All they did previously was just cast the thing to an int before doing them, so it's pretty easy to update your code to do that. Um, but in the future, we're going to have a wider set of modeling types available, um, signed, unsigned, sfix, ufix, float, things like that. And that should be able to uh, bring back that uh, functionality. And finally, CocoTB Resolve X was removed. Um, it's kind of a massive foot gun. So um, there's some mitigations done to help port your code forward on that. But if you get X's out of your simulation, you might have something wrong with your simulation. All right, handles. 
Okay, so uh, what changed? We just talked about logic array and array. Those are the types that are now coming out of handles when you get the values from them. So uh, you're getting logic array, not binary value anymore. And when you get the value from an arrayed signal, you're getting an array, not just a Python list anymore. And um, we've done some things to ease uh, forward compatibility there. Uh, so we've ported some of the interface from binary value forward. So the example you see on the right, that works in 1.8 with binary value, and it also works in 2.0. And for typical things, you know, casting things to int, strings, and comparisons, simple tests should continue to function as they did before. All right, and the major incompatibility, in my opinion, is moving to array for the um, arrayed signals. Uh, so it used to be a Python list, which was always indexed uh, zero to length minus one, but now it uses the HDO index. So as you can see in the example, if you have an array that's defined three down to zero, zero is no longer the leftmost value, it's the rightmost value. So that might bite you. All right, um, and there's also a new indexing syntax. So when you were getting children objects from um, the dot object, you always would do like dot, you know, child object. And that has some limitations. There are ways to name signals that aren't valid Python identifiers. So uh, just introduced a square bracket syntax with the strings to be able to index into that. And you can support, uh, we can support now Extended identifiers, you know, Verilog can have uh, dollar signs in the names, things like that. All right. And some other random incompatibilities in the handles. Um, the classes were refactored and were named, so if you were using them for like type annotations, this is gonna be a bit different now. I might have to update that stuff. Um, and supporting for indexing the packed objects was removed because it just did not work consistently in any way. And we can see there on the right some examples of how to update some of your code to work with the uh, change removal of the uh, packed object syntax. So um, if you were trying to set a value on a single bit, you would just do like a read, modify, write. You could just do a single com bit comparison by indexing the value instead of the handle itself. Um, and if you needed to do an edge trigger on a single value, you can just use a little bit of logic and an edge trigger over the entire array. All right, concurrency. So you all may have seen the deprecation warning a while ago. Um, Coco TV that starts soon was deprecated and it's finally been removed in 2.0. Uh, it's a remo uh, replacement for Coco TV that fork and fork was removed because it was causing some bugs that were kind of hard to um, fix otherwise. So we can see an example of how that works on the right there. We have our drive inputs coroutine. It's uh, just every edge writing, uh, adding a value, like incrementing it. And we're using Coco TV that starts soon. Oops, that shouldn't have appeared. Um, and uh, it's running that concurrently to the code below it, which is simply just checking to see that the output of the flip-flop is that expected pattern. And there is some incompatibilities there. So start soon and now runs the thing soon instead of immediately and that might cause issues for your simulation. And that, if that is the case, then there is an alternative, uh, Coco TV that start, which is a uh, uh, coroutine itself. And that is going to pause the current coroutine and allow that other one to run. So if you run into issues with that, um, I would suggest trying Coco TV that start. Another thing uh, is task.cancel. So this is a replacement for task.kill. And uh, it works a little bit more like it would in async IO, where um, it allows the task to clean itself up by throwing a cancel there into the task when it is killed. So we can see an example there on the right. Uh, we have that drive inputs, and it's going to be running concurrently. And we're going to run 100 outputs, and we want to eventually cancel it, right? But the issue is, like, it could be in the middle of driving something when we cancel it. And we don't want to like just leave a valid high or something like that. So we want to at the end, you can set that valid low. And it's going to throw a canceled error in where that await drive is. And that finally block is going to drive it back to idle. 
And that will work for finally blocks, that will work for context managers, things like that, which takes us into our next a new feature, which is the task manager. So this was inspired by like system bear logs, fork join, or trios, nurseries, async IOs, task groups. Um, and it's a way for structuring asymmetric concurrency. So you would use start soon if you were, say, starting up a task to run a driver or a monitor or something that's going to be independent, always running. You're never intending to join it. And CocoTV, uh, sorry, uh, the task manager is going to be for all those other cases where you would join it. So we can see a simple example here on the right. Well, within a test, you know, we need to drive something, we need to check something, and we spit up uh, two different tasks for doing each of those things. And when the task manager context ends, it's going to join all of those tasks together so that they all finish. All right, uh, there's a couple other features with this. Um, just go through those real quick. You know, start things soon, um, just like you would at top level. You can await on tasks and you can cancel them. You can handle exceptions just like you would with any other type of task. Um, it also ex uh, supports exception groups and the accept SAR syntax from Python 3.11. This is kind of like reusing uh, async IO's task groups functionality. And uh, the cool thing here is when you do a t uh, cancel on a task that has a task manager, because it is a context manager, um, it's going to run that code to clean up all of its children, and it'll do that recursively. So if you cancel a task, it'll cancel all the children too. You won't leak any tasks accidentally. All right, additional. And there's a, just a handful of other changes. So. Now that we're refining the public API, we can make some more guarantees about that API and the stability of it. So these numbers will actually mean something now with semantic versioning. Uh, documentation is going to be improved. Everything that is public is going to be documented. And we're going to be guaranteeing that by running PyDoc style and CI. And typing. We're going to have everything that's going to be typed now. And you're going to be able to get better suggestions in your editors. You can run typing against your own projects. And that's all going to be guaranteed by running MyPy. And CI. All right, so uh, I, ETA is going to be the holidays 2024. Please try it out. You can follow some of the links to discuss things and uh, see all the changes. There's actually quite a few. Let's um, actually want to do that real quick. Just show you all the stuff that's happened. This, this is where 2.0 starts here. There we are. That's one point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, questions? Simon, yeah. Um, Go for it. Does uh, CocoTB2, is that, does that support real number modeling? Question is, does CocoTB2 support real number modeling? Uh, yes, it does. Um, you can get. Uh, Floating point values out of any real number. Does it handle it with buses with uh, floating point? Uh, does it handle it with floating point buses? Um, floating point bus. Array structure for arrays of floating point numbers when they're in buses. Are you talking about like uh, the float type, uh, like BHDO, um, converting into that, or? Yeah, we're in Verilog. Oh, in Verilog. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, we don't have support for that yet. That's going to be coming on a future version. So I have uh, two questions. Uh, first, uh, will there be some kind of um, like uh, conversion routines or some kind of guide to help people migrating to? Uh, yes, that's definitely in the document. Yeah. Something that would get done before you point out. And the other question is, so right now I'm using Coco to be through uh, Fuse Like uh, so, um, because it's just basically just loading your, your VPI library. Uh, with the new things like the test run integration, uh, is there any more like advanced communication that needs to be taken care of? Because before it's just this VPI library, and there is a couple of environment variables, and that's kind of it. Uh, it's going to be the same style. Um, there's going to be environment variables and all that. Uh, there's some new ones changed, uh, added 
just because uh, interaction between the Python environment and Cocoa TV has gotten unfortunately more complicated, but uh, it should be very simple. Very good. We might just um, finish with one quick comment, which is a big kind of thank you to you and the rest of the Cocoa TV team who have been developing this over the years. It's it's um, I think one of the more promising kind of like open source EDA tools. Um, I've used it a lot in recent years. It's it's excellent, and I hadn't actually clocked all of the changes that had come into 2.0. This is quite a significant um, update, and uh, obviously there's been a lot of work that's gone into that over the years. We see you guys turn up every year to OACONF, which is awesome, uh, and it's really good to see this kind of come to a head with this latest, you know, full point release or full version release that's gone on. So um, yeah, let's thank Caleb. Cheers, guys.